to uh, all of you that have organized this and uh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great fun. I've been uh, watching these uh, seminars now for, for, the, for the fall and uh, uh, it's fun to be here and uh, present this work. Uh, so this, um, this is a, a paper that a uh, single author, I wrote it, uh, 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 I started first version of this a couple of years ago and then Yvonne uh, told me he didn't like the econometrics of it. So I went ahead and I changed all the econometrics. And uh, so the result is what, you, uh, what I'm gonna present today. So it's gonna be about predictability. So a lot of people are interested in predictability and especially in derivatives. Uh, and especially recently, maybe in the last 10 years with uh, the emergence of this variance risk premium literature and so on. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about a predictability regression along the lines of equation uh, one here. Uh, it's a standard regression where people are regressing overlapping returns from time t to t plus h onto some state variable x. I'm gonna denote uh, the, the, the constant by a h and, and b h for the slope coefficient. Um, so classic studies of predictability go back to the 80s uh, with various papers, dividend yield, uh, it's big literature on dividend yields and price dividend ratios. Um, but recently this literature on um, the variance risk premium in particular and some other kind of option implied risk variables uh, that people have sort of looked at, Balashlev uh, uh, and Todorov, uh, and uh, Torben Anderson and uh, those guys have a bunch of papers where they try to look at uh, option uh, tail indices and so on and so forth. So I'm going to be looking at that as well today. Now, um, so, um, you know, different ways to think about this. Uh, there are two interpretations, right? Uh, you can think about uh, predictability, uh, uh, maybe the classic interpretation of predictable return patterns is that uh, returns are, uh, uh, markets are inefficient. Uh, Although recently, starting with BTZ and uh, maybe Dreschler, your own, and other kind of papers like that, uh, there are uh, this this emerging understanding that maybe this is an equilibrium risk premium. Right? So, uh, so I'm interested in this uh, idea that uh, returns are predictable because of equilibrium uh, risk premium. So, if you take expectations, right, conditional expectations, you just simply interpret this equa a regression equation as being a, a forecast uh, of returns. Uh, and then of course you have to interpret X over here as being some sort of risk variable. Uh, so this is sort of the starting uh, pattern. So in order to sort of uh, get at this point and ask yourself, is this uh, consistent with equilibrium? What kind of equilibrium uh, would generate predictability? No, first of all, uh, and I didn't say it on the previous slide, but I'm gonna be interested in the entire term structure of predictability. So I'm interested in uh, predictability at, at all horizons, okay? So I'm gonna be interested in just not much as three months out or six months out as sort of a point, but the entire term structure of predictability. So I'm gonna be interested in BH basically for, the, uh, for all sort of practical uh, forecasting horizons, maybe from one month up until a year or something like that. And also I should say that I don't have much to say about the price dividend uh, or price earnings ratio literature uh, where people are looking at really long-term predictability, maybe up to like five, you know, 10, 15 years, something like that, uh, because uh, that requires a different way of thinking about it actually. So, but let me get back to that later. Uh, here, uh, what I have is a basic sort of setup and this graph is super important in the, in the sense that it kind of conveys the, the basic intuition about what's going on in all equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium models uh, in that um, prices, well, in equilibrium, we'll have an expected steady price appreciation path, right? So it's, there's, it's actually gonna be equal to the um, average dividend growth or something like that, but that's beside the point. When there's a shock to expect the rate of return in an equilibrium model, what typically happens is that prices adjust. Why? Because so that they can mean revert at a steeper uh, rate if the shock to expect the return is positive, right? So. What happens this is standard present value discounting. There's a shock to expect the rate of return. Prices have to come down. And what happens? Well, so prices come down and then they mean revert back um, at some rate. And I'm gonna be talking about the rate at which they're mean reverting because that's super important to this. Um, but notice that if you look at the graph, it's sort of a graph where 
you know, what comes up must come down, or in this case, the way I've drawn it, what goes down must come up again, right? So it, it'll be a temporary adjustment of the price process. The price responds at time zero in response to the shock to expect the rates of return, which is obviously uh, unpredictable. And then uh, the price will mean revert at, the, at some rate. So that's the way all equilibrium models work, essentially. If you look at long-run risk models, all of the, the bonds, all your own model, Dressler, your own, BTZ, some of my own models, and so on and so forth. So all these models work like this. Um, so there are two sort of immediate conclusions to this when you look at it. Their mean reversion in the stock price following the shock to expected rates of return, there's gonna be two things that happen. There's no mean reversion unless the price adjusts at time zero in response to the shock. Um, so that's number one. Uh, the impact of the shock to expect the return dissipates over time. So if you look at the graph, right, it's steeper in the beginning and then it sort of flattens out, which is reasonable because the, the effect of the shock dissipates. In fact, um, you, I'm going to show you, and this is, this is obvious and this, this happens in all this equilibrium model, the rate at which the, mean, the prices are mean reverting in response to the shock, in other words, the, the slope of that uh, essentially uh, uh, impulse response function uh, is going to be the same as the rate of mean reversion in the state variable, right? So if you have a state variable that is very persistent, you can expect the, the expected rate of return to revert more slowly and vice versa. Okay, so what am I going to do in this paper? I'm going to derive a relationship between that shock at time zero, the um, the size of the shock, the expected, um, and the persistence in the exogenous state variable, the risk variable, and the slopes of the predictability regression. So I'm going to show you that. And under fairly general assumptions, you're just going to be able to put structural restrictions onto the slopes in these predictability regressions that are, are uh, generated by equilibrium. And I'm going to refer to all this as an equilibrium generated predictability, and I'm going to carry out an econometric test of this. So the whole, the whole idea of the paper is basically to say, okay, look, given this first graph that I have, I'm going to basically just uh, design an econometric test that allows me to test for this. And of course, I'm going to run that test across some of these uh, option-related uh, variables that people are interested in, including, of course, uh, variance risk premium. So if I go back and I start with this, and then here's, here's where it comes down to, all dividend discounting models essentially right, have a a functional form where the price dividend ratio is just some function of a state variable. And for, for now, I'm going to assume that there's a single state variable, it's a scale R. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm also going to assume it's an AR1, but that's not um, critical. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to um, generalize this uh, in uh, a little bit. Now, if you bear with me a little bit here, I'm going to say, okay, well, if I have a price dividend ratio that is some function of the state variable, typically what ends up happening in this equilibrium literature, including bounce all their own and habit models and so on and so forth, is that we we operate with a with a log linear price dividend ratio in equilibrium, and so the equilibrium is characterized by this. Um, this is follows by assumption, or in fact by approximation in in bounce all your own. Um, and, and most other models as well, uh, which are long run risk models. Um, but it's a very good approximation. Uh, you can also think that if this uh, equation number two here, uh, we don't know anything about F, maybe F is nonlinear in some you know, more dramatic way than uh, exponential function, um, then um, we can do a first order approximation or log approximation. We can still come back with something like equation number three as a first order approximation uh, to what's going on. So this is uh, the starting point. All of these actually long run risk models that people work on um, have this feature to them. Um, so what happens then? Next, I'm going to actually, th this is an assumption, which again, I'm going to relax it later on. But I'm going to assume for now that the X is an AR1 uh, state variable. So the assumption is some sort of exogenous state variable X um, follows an AR1, and um, um, it, is, it is then 
uh, entering into the price dividend ratio in this following way. So this is, you know, is fairly standard in the, at least in the long run risk literature. Now a little bit of math here. If you just play around with this equation number, um, number four, uh, excuse me, number uh, three over here, the price dividend ratio, you can just take, take differences. And it follows automatically that the capital gain by taking, uh, taking differences, you see that the capital gain is gonna be given by some sort of innovation in the state variable multiplied by some constant uh, plus some innovations, right? So um, this equation number five follows from equation number three. And if you take conditional expectations here, you recover equation number six, where you see that uh, what I refer to beta zero here is a feedback coefficient, which is the, which is the link, right? So that this is go, goes back to, again, to equation number three here. It's that coefficient that uh, is part of the equilibrium structure uh, of the model of the solution. So <clears throat> as soon as you have one of these uh, models, you're gonna see that the predictability um, and the conditional expectation or the conditional cap uh, expected capital gain is going to be equal to some constant plus uh, xt multiplied by beta zero, rho to the power of h minus one. And rho here is going to be the autocorrelation of the x, right? So this equation number six is basically the, 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 the story, the whole story in the paper. Um, the point here is that you immediately recognize that if you run this regression that we started off with, right, the slope coefficient is going to have to be equal to beta zero times rho uh, to the power h minus one. Um, and so this is the the structural restriction that is the kind of the baseline uh, restriction that I'm going to be testing in the model. So if you run this regression again, I'm just going to uh, re rewrite this. And here, by the way, I've taken a little bit of liberty here uh, and to re uh, and reinterpreted return as a capital gain. Why can I do that? Well, it's because over short horizon, particularly up to a, a year, uh, variation in dividends don't really matter that much. All the predictable variation in returns is coming from capital gains. <clears throat> so this is equivalent. So Bjorn, let me interrupt you for a second. Yeah. So this is a clarifying question from Andrea Tomani. Uh, are you assuming away dividend predictability? Um, no, I actually had it. Uh, it's in the paper. I've assumed it away here because it's empirically irrelevant, at least in, in short horizons. Um, but you can put that in there and the, equ the equation is going to be slightly different. Right, mm -hmm. but empirically, it, it turns out it doesn't really matter, and this this math is so much more uh, simple, and uh, and so I can you know I focus on this for now anyway. Uh, so this is going to be a restructural restriction that you can just test, right? So if you go back again, this beta zero, beta naught here is going to be that coefficient that that um, relates uh, the um, the the that is an equilibrium coefficient, which you can also estimate by OLS, by just looking at the contemporaneous correlations between uh, uh, price changes and changes in the state variable. So it's very easy. We can get very, very accurate estimates of beta naught. And also rho, of course, is the autocorrelation of the state variable. So in other words, what I have here is a structural restriction that tells me that the slope and the predictability regression is going to have to be equal to beta naught times rho h minus 1. So it's a very simple structural restriction, and the whole paper is basically uh, just about protesting this uh, restriction. So I want to say a few things though before I move on, because most of the predictability literature is concerned with overlapping re um, regressions. And over here, of course, uh, this is an overlapping regression essentially. Um, I'm going to be doing things slightly differently for econometric reasons. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about this. So if you have a, an H if you have returns H periods out, right? So for return the return from period T to, a, you know, or T, T plus H minus one till T plus H. So it's a one period return H periods into the future. If you run the, that regression of that one period return onto the state variable today as of time T, um, the following relationship um, re ensues. So you're gonna have that the cumulative uh, slope coefficient, as in, in other words, the slope coefficient that you get when you run a regression of the cumulative return, so the H period overlapping return, if you want, um, it's just going to be the sum of the one period slopes, okay? 
So this is um, uh, this is actually well known. Goes back to Hodrick, uh, and it's obvious from the you know the math in equation number uh, eleven. Um, so what I'm going to be doing, uh, I'm actually interested in testing for predictability, not just in one horizon, not just one period. I'm in interested in testing across n periods, right? So n periods. If I have n, if n is equal to twelve, if I have twelve months in my forecast. So I'm looking at say variance risk premium for from today, one month up until 12 months. I'm interested in testing for predictability across the entire term structure. So I'm interested in testing this structural relationship. So the obvious thing to do is just to construct like a quadratic test statistic along the lines of what you find in any uh, textbook. So over here, uh, beta, beta hat is the estimated uh, slope coefficient or vector of slope coefficients across n horizons. Uh, in the forecasting uh, regression. And B star is the hypothesized um, one period. So this is actually the expression for the one period ahead. I'm going a little quick on the math here, but the one period ahead is gonna look like this. It's gonna be beta mod uh, times uh, rho h minus uh, rho h uh, to the power, or rho to the power of h minus one. So this is gonna be <clears throat> uh, the one period ahead uh, slope coefficient. And if I, uh, you know, I wanna test um, I want to have an ectometric test that basically tests that all these slope coefficients are equal to uh, the theoretical value. So this is my uh, quadratic test, the standard quadratic test. And omega obviously is going to just be the covariance matrix of all these uh, slope coefficients, uh, which actually I also have an expression for in the paper. So of course, I'm going to have to do this in a sort of a feasible way. I'm going to have to replace you know, these hypothesized parameters with uh, B, B, you know, B beta, beta not hat, right? Which is an OLS estimate and, and rho, which is also an OLS estimate of the autocorrelation uh, in the state variable. So I'm gonna plug this stuff here into the, the test statistic and I derive an expression for omega, uh, which is the covariance matrix of all these things. And I have an expression for that actually in the paper and I'm not gonna bother you with the expression because it's long and tedious, but it turns out under the distributional assumptions that I made so far, uh, I can actually compute it analytically. And so I do that in the paper and it's a long nasty expression. Uh, but it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to look at because you can see what happens as you, as you uh, uh, zero out some of the parameters and so on and so forth. So at any rate, uh, so you can look at that in the paper. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, just have a look at to see how this works. And so I took some uh, sample parameters, generated some data under the null, obviously. And, um, and I looked at the size and then the size is spot on. This is for uh, six months ahead and 12 months ahead. And you see I have a, you know, with the nominal size of 5%, I'd reject about 5% and 1% uh, of the time. So, so let, me, let me interrupt you again. Mm -hmm. So from Christian, Giglio and Kelly, QG 2018 document that using claims on the same cash flow stream, long maturity prices are significantly more variable than justified by the variation at short maturities. This implies that the internal consistency conditions in standard models are rejected by the data. What implications, if any, does this have for your tests, given that they impose the null across multiple forecasting horizons? I can't I can possibly answer that because I, it's just the variance. Uh, it's that the paper on, uh, on variance claims, right? And they just, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't remember the paper good enough. Okay, yeah. so, so actually, I'm not sure what paper Christian's talking about, too. So I'll let you and Christian talk about yeah. it afterward. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, I, I love to talk to, about any anything. And I think, that, you know, one of the questions I do get about this is like, okay, so what are the implications for specific models up there? I think the natural question to ask, like, what is the implication for some of these other models that people know, like BTZ and uh, Dreschler, Yaron, and so on and so forth, and some of my own models. And I can talk, maybe Bonsal, Yaron, and, you know, we can talk about that uh, as, we, as we go along a little bit. Uh, let me say, I can also do something here so all of the, the, this so far, the, the previous uh, math that I did here um, was, was done based on uh, these one period, you know, uh, return regressions. And you can actually generate this so you can actually compute the covariance matrix. Uh, so you have omega, right? So which is the covariance matrix of so the one period uh, coefficients 
and you can generate this or you can um, you can this is a nice little aggregation formula that allows you to compute the covariance matrix uh, for uh, for overlapping returns. Um, so that's actually uh, uh, I'm also going to just use this to compute t, t statistics. So it's an alternative estimator for uh, standard errors or, or t stats for uh, individual slope coefficients for overlapping returns. Uh, but anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and just go ahead and um, and uh, run these tests now across uh, different. Um, uh, different variables, uh, and of course, uh, notably uh, variance risk premium and the various components of variance risk premium. So I'm going to look at. Uh, I actually took Hausu's data, uh, and um, one of the surprising things about Hausu's data, uh, this is updated, I think, through um, the end of 2018 or something like that. <clears throat> uh, the uh, first order auto autocorrelation in VRP is actually pretty low at 0.28. Um, and this is, I should say, is the first version of VRP, which is the same version uh, or the definition of VRP that they used in their paper, um, which is uh, basically a backwards looking uh, realized volatility over the previous month minus uh, implied uh, variance. Uh, so the, um, uh, there's an alternative one that has, <clears throat> uh, you, that uses a um, objective uh, prediction for the next month VR uh, uh, realized variance, right? So you take that pred prediction and you uh, subtract off the um, uh, implied um, uh, variance. So that's a different definition. That turns out doesn't predict returns uh, nearly as well as the uh, VRP one. So, uh, so I'm using the one that actually does predict returns uh, the best. <clears throat> So predictability of uh, VRP is strong. Uh, so this is a table that just summarizes all this stuff. And I'm going to spend a lot of more time on VRP uh, than I do on these other things, because it's kind of the, the big elephant in the room. So if you look, this is basically just replicating uh, BTZ and a bunch of other papers. So if you look one period ahead, you see here one period ahead, right? R squared of 5%. Uh, and this is for the cumulative regressions. And so 10%, and it peaks at about 4 four months out, so you have an R square of 11%, which is, if you're predicting returns, right, it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, R square. Uh, it's a lot of predictability. So, and this is uh, statistically significant uh, if, you, if you look at period by period. Um, and I've computed this now using various different standard errors. It turns out hotter standard errors are the most conservative ones. Um, a new West standard, new West standard errors, uh, actually it's a different, maybe a different paper, but new US standards don't work at all, uh, very well anyway. Uh, and they produce uh, very large uh, t-statistics, much larger than um, these other methods. My method, this is my analytical uh, covariance uh, matrix estimator, uh, then aggregated obviously to deal with the, uh, the cumulative uh, returns. You see, I've actually computed the one period return here uh, or coefficients as well. So you see these guys, right? So these are much smaller. Uh, so this is four and and you know you know three and four and three and so on and so forth. And then after five months, you see it, it actually goes the opposite direction. Um, by the way, they should these should all be if it if it was to be consistent with equilibrium, these should all be uh, actually positive, right? Um, and these this is the cumulative uh, coefficients down here in the third row, and this is the beta. So so you see here that for one period out, obviously it's just going to be the same, but. Uh, and then this one, uh, the, this, the, these numbers actually obtain as the cumulative sum of the previous one period uh, per, per that formula that I showed you. So this is, uh, you know, just a basic, uh, basically everything in this table is just replicating BTC and everything is consistent with BTC. Um, moving on, I estimated beta zero, right? So this is the feedback coefficient. This is the correlate. Essentially, if you regress return, of, um, you know, uh, contemporaneously, right, onto the changes in the state variable, in this case, variance risk premium, you're gonna find an, a coefficient estimator uh, like point, 0 0.03. This is actually, you know, the, the, the actual size of this, uh, the actual magnitude doesn't matter. It's like, a, you know, scaling issues happening here. Um, rho again is 0.28, which is fairly low. And then these other parameters that are relevant uh, the standard deviations of the uh, innovations and the returns and also the, uh, the state variable are estimated. Uh, just, you know, this is all just standard OLS stuff. And given all this stuff, I should be having, and this is the theoretical slope coefficient that you should be observing in equilibrium. 
you should have a slope coefficient of about 2.25, 0.6, 0.18, 0.05, and, point, and basically zero thereafter. If you look anything beyond four months out, uh, the, slope, the theoretical slope coefficient for VRP should be zero. And the reason why that happens is that it's so unpersistent, if that's the word. Um, there's so little persistence in, in variance risk premium in Hauzu's data anyway, that any shock, any equilibrium shock should die out basically after three months, right? So this is sort of the, 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 the big thing here. There is a negative response. So whenever there's, there's an increase in the variance risk premium, there is actually a, a negative shock to return. So do you see that from this beta knock coefficient estimate? But um, this is actually then, um, um, this dies out, the shock to variance risk premium dies out so quickly that uh, you see these coefficients here uh, go rapidly to zero. Of course, the estimated coefficients, uh, I just repeated from the previous uh, table, are, are much larger, right? So the, the first, the, in the one month out, it's on the order of twice of what you should be observing empirically, you know, and here, you know, the, the difference between these things are very large and the differences are given down here. Here you have a, you know, pairwise or, or period wise T statistics. You can just look at this period by period if you want to. And you see the difference between the two are, are very large and like T stat of 3.6. And of course I can construct this uh, multivariate test statistic that I uh, talked about before. And you see that down here is computed for six months and 12 months out and the p-values of these things are basically zero. So it rejects the null that VRP is consistent with the predictability in VRP is consistent with equilibrium. Um, and it happens basically because this parameter is very, very, very low. There's not a lot of persistence in, in, in VRP. And this is, this is a negative, uh, it's maybe could have been, you know, uh, we should look, you know, look at implied variance to see that it's going to be much larger. But at any rate, uh, you can't you can't reconcile the term structure predictability in VRP with equilibrium. And the reason, well, uh, one sort of simple way to think about this is that what well, what happens, right? When you look at predictability in VRP, uh, it's really strong three and four months out, right? Over here, you see this individual. So if you take three month returns three months from now. Right or four months from now, are going to be strongly predictable, or you know, strongly, relatively strongly predictable by today's VRP. Right? But what is the intuition why that doesn't work out? Well, the reason why it doesn't work is that any shock to VRP is going to be gone three months from now. Right? Three, four months from now, it's all dissipated. There's, it's all news. So there's no reasonable way that in equilibrium returns three and four months down the road should be predictable by VRP. Because it's just simply isn't any, there's not enough persistence in VRP. Right? So that's the intuition. Uh, and then I'm gonna go do, do this thing. I'm gonna go a little bit quicker with these other variables because they're not quite as interesting. If you look at components of VRP, you know, I can look at implied variance. This is just squared mix. This is very persistent. And it's also very strongly negatively contemporaneously correlated with returns. We all know that, right? It's a very strong correlation. We look at the, the stock market today is down huge, VIX is up huge, right? It's a very strong uh, contemporaneous uh, negative correlation. Uh, and uh, when you run the test, the problem here, right? Implied variance doesn't predict returns at all, but it should. So that's the problem with this. It, it should predict returns. The theoretical slope coefficient should be fairly large. You should have a positive predictability. And this is, of course, something that we already know. Lots of papers have documented that, you know, hey, there's no predictability from variance. Or so, so, variance. so let me interrupt you again. Mm -hmm. So from Mike Chernoff, uh, on slide 19, what if the true state is multidimensional? Does rejecting VRP regression really reject equilibrium? And from Yvonne, uh, it's observation, it's a joint test of predictability and the AR1 model for VRP. Okay, so I'm gonna, to, to, uh, to uh, turn off the question, uh, I'm gonna be looking at multivariate in, in a minute, okay? So as soon as I get through these univariate things, I'm gonna be looking at multivariate. 
Uh, and what was Yvonne's question again? Well, okay. Yvonne's is basically making the same point. Okay, yeah. So to both of you, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah, in a second. And then while um, we're while we're on interruptions, actually from Dimitri, right? So so Travis Johnson, you know, makes this argument that you should basically do GLS, right? Because you yeah. know that there's a lot of heteroscedasticity in these predictive regressions. Right, right. And his paper is a really nice paper. Uh, it's in the wraps, and I, I right. read it quite carefully. It's it's uh, um, yeah. So he makes the point that these coefficient estimates are biased if you don't use GLS. And I, I think that's a point well taken. And, but, um, and that, but, you know, the, his, his point should apply to, to all of the, the, the entire literature, right? So when people are looking at predictability, we should be using GLS and we have some sort of instrument for time and volatility. That's his point. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and I think that that point is well taken. The, the, the thing here is that well, I want to do what people are doing in the literature. When people are documenting that VRP is, you know, predicting returns, they're using OLS. So I'm using OLS for that reason. But I could easily well just, you know, apply this th thing here into a GLS uh, uh, setting and impose these restrictions onto GLS estimated coefficients. All right. So that so, so I think that that is a that is a good point. Um, uh, so I haven't I haven't done that as of as of right now, but I think that's something we should consider doing. But it, you know, it's a it's a there's a bigger agenda there too, right? What what is really the correct way to do inference for these things? And it's probably not OLS, right? And it's probably certainly not OLS with uh, with new OS standard errors. Anyway, moving on. Um, so this is the very uh, so th that was uh, okay. Go, moving on. Uh, next slide. Implied variance. Okay, zero uh, predictability. And of course, with zero predictability, since the theoretically, given these parameters, theoretically, there ought to be a lot of predictability. Of course, I'm going to reject a null, right? So this is the, the data, the, predict, the lack of predictability is not consistent with equilibrium for the opposite reason, uh, you know, as, as variance risk premium. Variance risk premium, um, there's too much predictability. For uh, implied variance, there's not enough. Uh, so that's uh, the problem with that data. Same with thing with realized variance. Um, again, very little predictability, if anything. And again, of course, I'm going to reject the null um, because realized variance should predict returns in the same way as variance should, or uh, implied variance. And again, so you know, the multivariate tests here are like really big um, rejections of the null. And then finally, I looked at this tail uh, index of Balochlev um, et al. And here, um, this actually, the, the news is a little bit better. If you look at the bottom here, you see that my multivariate test does not reject the null. Uh, so this is actually consistent with equilibrium. Uh, the only problem here is that there's actually not a whole lot of predictability in this variable. So when they published a paper, um, they uh, reported very large amounts of predictability from this variable. And it was uh, actually in, um, uh, I think they published a paper maybe like you know, 2015 or 16 or something. So it's a little while back. And then Victor and, uh, and Torben have maintained a website called tailindex.com where they, they present this data. When, but when you look at, you take the more recent data that are reporting in there, there's, there's not much predictability uh, in the updated uh, sample. So um, again, um, this is, you know, in some sense, good news for their um, kind of candidate risk variable. I can't reject the null that it's consistent with equilibrium, but there's also not a whole lot of action happening here. There's just not, you know, almost any predictability. Um, so anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about standby bias because this goes back a little, is sort of semi-related, I guess, to uh, Travis Johnson's paper. But um, people ask me this question: What what about standby bias? How does that affect things? And it turns out, of course, it's go it's going to affect things. So my so all the 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 predictability slopes, right, are going to have standby bias. Um, because, uh, and that's true under the G GDP that I have, because in the GDP that I have, it's actually exactly the same GDP as in Stambas uh, 99 paper. Um, and it turns out that what we can do, uh, what happens, right, is it's one of the interesting things is that what I'm looking at, right, is uh, my test statistic is based upon the estimated slope coefficient, we know that this one has standby bias, right? So the, the BH here is going to have standby bias. But also, as it turns out, the row, right? The row, the persistence in the state variable is also biased. 
uh, because that's where the standby bias actually comes from when you look at the expression for the standby bias. And it turns out it's actually kind of this one of the remarkable things that if H, if you have one period ahead, it's actually canceled, the two cancel, because then, you know, and the, and the math is actually uh, straightforward. This expression, it doesn't generally cancel for longer forecasting horizons, but it does cancel, cancel for the just one period ahead. And it's actually relatively small uh, for other uh, horizons as well. So I'm just gonna leave that there. Here, I actually quantified it uh, for two, uh, you know, and uh, show that it's actually, uh, we actually, it's actually not an issue. Okay, so just uh, uh, moving on from there. I, I guess I have 20, 23 minutes left. Um, so one of the things you know, Mike asked me about is the multivariate situation. What happens in a multivariate uh, with a multiple state variable? So of course there are multiple state variables. So there are actually multiple state variables in most of the models that people look at. Uh, it's true actually in the BTZ model as well. Uh, in BTC, people think about, okay, well, VRP is a price state variable. Variance is also, level of variance is also price state variable in that model and in most other models. So, you know, the, the world is multivariate. Um, so what happens, right? Well, suppose I just generalize the data generating process that I assumed initially to, to a VAR. Uh, and if I do a VAR, it's pretty, pretty obvious, you know, the math comes out like this. I'm going to have the structural restriction is going to be the time, you know, the slope coefficient. This is not going to be a vector of slope coefficients um, uh, for, for horizon H. Okay. And this is going to be equal to the, uh, the A matrix, the, the uh, VAR matrix raised to the power of H minus, you know, H, uh, A and raised to the power of H minus one again, multiplied by the vector now of response coefficients. Um, and so this, everything I've done so far, it's just straightforwardly generalize, generalizes into a multivariate situation. And of course I can compute, I can proceed as before with a covariance matrix. Of course, now I have to actually compute it numerically. I don't have an analytic expression anymore because the math is too, uh, too messy. So I've done this, I've run this bivariate tests. And so this is actually going back to uh, Mike's question, of course. Uh, what happens if you um, look at multiple state variables? So the two, the two more reasonable candidates to look at is some the two, first two ones over here, which is VRP plus some some level factor or variance. And here also we forget about this equation. I'm controlling here for some shocks to dividends and stuff like that. But at any rate, so the, the test statistics uniformly right at six months and twelve month horizons uh, reject a null. Why is that? Well, it rejects for the same reason as it does for the univariate case. Adding in IV or RV over here to the test is just going to add a little bit of noise, essentially. And it's it's you know you're going to get you're going to get strong rejections of the null. So this is and then people have asked me before. How Zhu asked me this? So I gave a, a presentation in uh, Chichingua um, a couple of weeks ago, and then he asked me. So well, how do you how do you, can you test the BTC model? This is basically the BTC model. Okay, so this is so because in Balash Latak and Zoo, there are two price state variables, the level of the variance and VRP, or you can rotate the, the factors in their model in such a way that you can interpret it that way. So you're gonna end up with some notion of, of the level of variance plus VRP is gonna be, you know, spanning the, 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 um, the space of price risk factors. So these, this regression here, with VRP plus IV is one potential way to think about this or VRP plus, plus realized variance, uh, potentially realized variance, you know, plus some noise or something. Uh, but if we think about realized variance as being a noise-free measure of actual spot variance or something like that, then this is an actual um, a test of their model. And of course it's rejected. Uh, if you take other pairs of state variables, IV plus RV over here, um, uh, then uh, you reject uh, for six months, not for uh, 12 months. Uh, and finally here, the, this, these pairs again, uh, it's, it, the test has more power when you run it only for six months because all of these state variables have relatively little persistence. So the, the, the tests are always gonna be more powerful. Uh, and you can always just you know, fail to reject the null if you just include like indefinite number of horizons. Um, so moving on, um, the, the final thing I wanted to look at uh, is um, 
a more complicated GDP for the X variables, right? So st the state variable, what happens if the state variable uh, is not Markov, it's not an AR1, right? And the more natural thing to be doing um, is to think about the state variable as being a ARMA PQ. Uh, and this, um, uh, this uh, so in this case, you know, I'm just gonna have uh, various uh, lags of, uh, of, um, uh, of P, um, of X and, and various lags and Q lags of the moving average terms. And I'm just gonna have, uh, I'm just gonna apply actually the, this equation that I had before, this equation here, because an, an ARMA PQ can actually be written as a VAR, a VR1, right? A, a, a first order uh, VAR, if you just define the state variables to be equal to the various components of the ARMA process. So if I, if, you know, if I define a state variable to be a multivariate state variable with the first state being XT, second state being XT minus one and so forth, and the T, uh, P plus Q state to be the, the residual term lag uh, Q times. Uh, so then I get uh, VA, uh, VR1 and I can apply the math from before and just, you know, I just got to map all these parameters, the row parameters and the, Q and the theta parameters into that A matrix. And uh, I have the math, the math of that in the appendix of the paper. And if you do this, I can actually estimate all these ARMA models across a bunch of different, uh, different, uh, all these different time series. And I'll actually gonna find uh, that when I do this, I'm gonna increase the R squares so of my predictability regressions, right? Because why does this happen? Well, it happens because uh, there is, uh, there's more stuff, right? There's more, there's more variables on the right-hand side of the equation. So uh, mechanically, uh, R squares are gonna uh, increase, but they actually increase uh, in some cases quite a bit here. Uh, you see here for VRP, I have an adjust for the cumulative return. So I, I actually get even higher R square. You remember for the one, for the, uh, here's the P1 zero, Q zero, case that they remember I have an R square about 11% uh, at, at, um, at four, uh, a four month horizon. And here with a complicated model of P equals three and Q equals four, uh, ARMA PQ model, I get an R square about maybe 16% or so at the three month horizon for VRP. So this is, um, so this is, uh, you know, mechanically it's gonna give me some in sample, better in sample fit. These are adjusted R squares though. Um, so let's see what happens. So actually the first thing I'm gonna show you is that the impulse response functions for the VRP on selected uh, for the various ARMA representations. So the, the first one, um, if you look at uh, the AR1 process, which is P1 Q0, that's the blue one here. And so you see here, uh, what's gonna end up happening is of course that there's some autocorrelation in the beginning and then it, it vanishes, right? It vanishes right away. So it's basically gone after, uh, after three or four months. Uh, so there's no persistence. Uh, there is, at least there's no long-term persistence. So one of the things that ARMA PQ might reasonably uh, help me get at is if there's some sort of long-term implication, right? Some sort of long-term uh, shock, some sort of component of the ARMA process that has a long-term uh, long impact on unexpected rates of return. And you see that this is potentially possible with VRP because when you estimate higher order models here, you see the, the, the blue line here, which is this one here, is going to be um, a, 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 a P2, uh, Q2 uh, model. And this does imply much more persistence in the long run. So it implies that shocks are lingering much longer than um, the AR1 process does. So this, so, you know, for this reason, you should imagine that the P2, the 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 two two model is actually potentially consistent with equilibrium. So we maybe we we kind of landed on something here uh, with the specification. If you look at these really high order specifications here, four and three and so on, you see all of these are really jagged, which I think is probably indicative of overfitting the data. But I wanted to include there. So I think we, we you know, the, the thing, the, the ones that I want to look at here are the, the P2Q1 and P2Q2 models that I think are maybe not overfit and then look as if they're picking up some long range 
uh, dependence in the VRP data. So when I run this, um, I'm gonna run it now because I'm gonna start looking at shorter horizons as well uh, and longer horizons. Gonna look up to from three to six months in order to get, because the number of parameters that I'm looking at now is sort of exploding, right? Because I have uh, more parameters in the models. And so I wanna kind of sharpen the, um, uh, the power of the tests a little bit by shortening the forecasting horizons. But uh, so this is up to three months. So you see here for VRP, I'm actually now, for 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 uh, the two for for P and Q less than two, everything is rejecting at the at the um, reasonable level. And one percent, I guess, is three stars. Uh, and then for the the three uh, the four and three and whatever, I can't reject a null. Um, for implied variance, uh, same pattern basically. If I get P and Q be very large, I can't reject a null. Um, and uh, then again, for um, RV, I actually rejected for any uh, combination. And for the, the tail index, uh, I don't reject, uh, except for one over here that looks kind of maybe suspicious. Um, but uh, you know, there's some there's some sort of tendency of this large order, especially with large order, large moving in, uh, average orders. Uh, that we kind of uh, suspect that we're overfitting the data. So this is for the three-month horizon. Uh, and um, the um, um, so let's look at what happens for six months. So again, for six months, I do reject a null. Remember here that you know the power is going to drop mechanically because I have just way too many parameters. And you see some weird stuff happening here for the, for the larger Q and P. Um, parameter uh, values, but if you see for P, uh, for the for the two two case, for the two one case, I reject for VRP, uh, I reject everything still for uh, implied variance, for realized variance, I, uh, you know, I reject pretty much. And again, for, for the tail index, uh, at least for low P's and Q's, uh, the conclusions from the one period, uh, or for the AR1, uh, case uh, that I don't reject are still intact. So everything kind of, uh, it's very, when I go multivariate, if I go VAR or if I go ARMA, right, basically the conclusion from the AR1 case uh, hold up. Um, so, but what, what is interesting, you know, this one in particular and this one, right, for for the P, P1 and uh, 2 case, uh, I, I do reject the null. So again, you know, adding all this persistence that I see over here for the P2, two case uh, here is uh, not enough to um, not reject a null, uh, that the predictability is not consistent with, um, with uh, uh, equilibrium. Now, the, the, what, there's one thing that is also interesting about this analysis that I didn't put in here, but when you go back and look at this, um, the, what happens in the in the multivariate case is that I have to I have to include multiple state variables. So what happens in the ARMA case? Well, each one of the ARMA components is going to be one component of the state variable X. Okay, so uh, what I end up doing is that I run a regression not on X, right? Not on variance risk premium. The forecast the forecast regression is not a re regression on on VRP itself. It's a regression on VRP, VRP lag up to P times, and then the innovations in VRP. So that there's all sorts of additional information being thrown into the forecasting regression. Of course, this is not the way people are running these predictability regressions in, in the literature. This is not the way BTC did it or anybody else, right? Um, so I do this because this is what happens. This is the, the only way to reasonably interpret this in an equilibrium model. I have to have all of the various components in that ARMA uh, process uh, be separate state variables to make sense of the specification. Um, so that's kind of use, useful to keep that in mind when you look at these results too, is that it's actually not a predictability re regression. It's a multivariate regression that is predicting returns over here. So beta hat here 
is going to be a vector, an X is a vector with all the various ARMA components uh, in it. <clears throat> um, so, that's, uh, so that's the way this comes out. So I'm actually basically done and I'm done uh, ahead of time because uh, adrenaline, um, it works. Uh, so let me uh, conclude and then hopefully uh, people have lots of uh, questions that I can answer. But the VRP, right, which is the, the, big, the big one out of all these predictors, uh, the return, the, the return um, it predicts returns up to four months in the data, right? So it looks very strong. And after that, it's not very, uh, uh, any strong predictability. It's, it's not very persistent. That's the problem with VRP. The shocks die out so quickly that it's very difficult to think that it's consistent with equilibrium in any way. Um, and the product, you know, the, in, intuitively, it's like this. I, if, to believe that VRP is an equilibrium, predictability from VRP is an equilibrium risk premium, I have to sit here today and think to myself that, wow, I think I should be getting additional rates of return by investing them in the market today because VRP four months ago was really high. And therefore I should be getting in the return premium today. Although the effect of that high VRP four months ago is already dissipated and VRP is completely different today. So that's what you have to believe in order for to believe that the VRP predictability four months and you know out is, is consistent with equilibrium. And of course, that is really, really hard sell if you think about the math of this. It just doesn't work. You know, there's not enough persistence in, in, in VRP to, to generate predictability. In fact, VRP or any other state variable that we observe should have more predictability at the short, at the short horizon. All of these, you know, these risk stories, when there's a shock to risk in the market, when variance goes up or VRP or whatever you believe is, is driving expected rates of return, should be variance really. Um, but when shock, when the risk is increasing, right, we should have more predictability in the short run, but we never observe that in the data. Never observe that in the data. When people talk, you know, people are pre constructing uh, predictability or regression, it's always the same story. We don't see any predictability at the one month or one year out, you know, or, or you know, one month. Or we don't see certainly anything at the one day horizon, right? We always see like, oh, well, it's like three, four, five, you know, months out. Or if it's, we talk about price dividend ratio, it's like five years or seven years out, um, which makes no sense, right? It makes no sense in an equilibrium setting. No equilibrium models will generate shocks that, you know, that, re that create a larger return premium six months or seven years down the road than they do today because the structure of the, the, the mean reversion and the, the risk variables is always going to be such that shocks today um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to require an immediate risk premium that is, that is larger than what it is down the road. So um, this is um, the term structure of predictability that we observe in the most of the predictability studies that people um, have produced is basically inconsistent with equilibrium. Um, and it's not just long run risk, right? It's, you, you know, like you can construct any kind of present value model and it's very, very difficult to construct a present value model that generates anything different than what I just said. So what is the problem, right? So this is the problem with VRP. The term structure is not predictable. Four months down the road, just doesn't work. Um, if, you look at, if you look at other variables, right? The things that really should predict returns, which are some notion of spot variance, either realized volatility or real, realized variance or implied volatility, implied variance should be predicting returns, right? That's true in any sort of reasonable model, right? If you look at almost any model, you're gonna see some sort of one-to-one -one map between VIX or VIX squared and spot volatility. And, you know, VIX just doesn't predict returns. And it's actually one of the really, I think it's one of the biggest um, puzzles in finance is that VIX doesn't predict returns because what happens, right? When VIX, when there's a shock to VIX like there is today, um, prices go down like we see today, but they never revert, right? They never revert. So never, we never see, you just don't see this here. You don't see this in the data, you know, for, for any variable. 
so that's the uh that's my talk i'm going to finish a couple of minutes early maybe well know. that's that's fine because there's there's a bunch of questions and comments in the chat i'll read some of them or summarize them but but while i'm doing that i should invite everyone to anyone who wants to, please feel free to turn on your microphones and ask questions orally. If you if you think I don't read your question from the chat correctly and you want to jump in and correct me or ask a follow up question, please feel free to. Anyway, so now it's a free for all. Feel free to use your microphones. So back on back from mike chernoff back on slide 27 there was what i thought was a comment rather than a question that drexler and your own actually have more states than you consider on uh, in that setup that long-run consumption risk is obviously important but there are also two factors involved i don't know if you want to respond to that no i think i think it's right i just don't i don't remember exactly the the model i have you are you are sorry before you answer i just wanted to chime in just to clarify my comment okay uh, so um right i don't want to get into bean counting oh this model has three factors and you have two and i don't want to go down this this line right i think sure. you spoke to like to the heart of my comment at the very end right like at some level, right, I have no doubt that you can test any configuration of these things, right? If I give you, if I give you M factors, VR or ARM or whatever, you can test it using your framework. And clearly, statistically, it's more attractive than what kind of ge generically people use literature, right? So the question, right, the heart of the question that you highlighted very early on when you had your kind of generic chart for equilibrium models is that can an equilibrium model generically capture the pattern that you're seeing with these variables, right? So my generic concern is that, for example, you test it with three variables, whatever you like, and the truth is, I don't know, 10 variables, right? Obviously, uh, if, if these variables correlated with each other, this could affect your OLS coefficients, right? Just because you kind of, right? N not because of small sample properties, but because you potentially to more factors. And so it would be nice to have some sort of generic feel that no matter what you do, Right, that this kind of rejection is generic. You kind of spoke to that qualitatively, but it would be nice to have some sort of exercise which explicitly shows that. So I don't know this what. Is where I'm so, so you want to have? I'm not sure what you're asking me. Do you want me to throw in more state variables? Because of course I could. Um, yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. I'm sure, I'm sure you can. Right, but it would be nice to have right. You kind of saying in words that your rejection is sort of generic, right? You're basically saying the patterns that you're finding, basically no equilibrium model can generate, right? So you kind well, of- I'm saying that it's obviously, it's obviously conditional upon the structure of the regression, right? So um, if, you know, yeah, you're right. If they're missing state variables in the, in the computation, the, the analysis is incorrect, but that's always true. It's true for any statistical, you know, exercise that you do ever. Um, yeah, absolutely. so the concern is that how easily can you translate it? Because you're kind of saying that this evidence is rejecting equilibrium models that we currently have in the literature in a sort of generic fashion, right? And so this generic yeah. thing, right, right. right is, so, so, so it, like it needs more work. You need more work to show that. I feel like I think I think you you may be right, uh, but the question is, what are those variables? Certainly. You know, if you look here, this certainly spans BTZ. BTZ, everything is Gaussian, everything, you know, the, you have the, the two factors in there. So does it span the, the, um, the Dressler your own uh, model? And I have to go back and look at that. Uh, I, I forget what they put in there. The, it spans some of my own models for sure. Um, it, sp it may not span everything. Um, there are people that look at, you know, like I have another paper where I look at VIX options right now, uh, where we have like time varying uh, jump intensity, uh, which generates um, generates uh, uh, time variation in uh, volatility of volatility. So those models that have time variation in volatility of volatility uh, would have a need to put in an additional state variable along the lines of VIX, you know, volatility of VIX, right? If you put that in there again, you know, I could have put that in here easily and to see what happens. I don't know that anybody's documented any predictability from VVIX though. So it's just going to kind of mess up the tests a little bit. 
uh, probably, or, or he's just going to uh, arrive at the obvious conclusion that there's no predictability there to begin with. So, you know, it's going to, um, so, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I can always, I, but I, you, you're probably right in that. I, if I want to make statements about VY or any other specific model, uh, I should go just make put, sure that the state variables span the, the set of variables that are in those models. Yeah, put differently, can, for example, Bansal Yaron and Yaron look at your evidence and say, oh, we can actually write down a model that uh, that uh, that matches all this evidence that Bjorn showed, right? That, that's another way to ask my question. Right? Well, I think a I new think model that would match your evidence. I think if they did, that'd be great. I mean, like if somebody writes down a model that passes these tests and still has some reasonable, meaningful amounts of predictability, um, you know, that that would be great. I mean, like that's then then we are one step toward resolving the puzzle that I'm documenting. Or not just documenting, like yeah, documenting and pinpointing, I guess. So the point is, for a given model, right? They a given model would should be able to pass these tests. Okay, so let me ask another question uh, from Andre Ormolov. I'm not sure. I'm sorry if for such a bad pronunciation, but anyway, the question is. It looks to me that the tests rely heavily on the Campbell-Schiller linearization, but it has been shown, for example, by Paul Schmetters and Wilms, JF 2018, that the approximation doesn't work very well for solving long-run long run risk models and that the correct true dynamics in these models are highly nonlinear. Yeah, I know that paper. Um, the um, First of all, it's, it's sort of a, uh, it's, it's not a universal statement that it doesn't work. It doesn't work uh, for certain parameters uh, close to the boundary where uh, you get a lot of equity premium and stuff like that. So it's not true that the approximation doesn't uniformly work. Uh, secondly, it's not true that I actually, well, I do rely on it uh, in as much as I assume that it's log linear, but I the, the other thing that you could in principle do over here is to say, okay, I'm going to do a first order Taylor approximation of some general nonlinear function F, which is going to, in, in this case, it's going to include additional polynomial terms of X, right? That's what a Taylor expansion would do. Um, if I did include those additional polynomial terms with additional coefficients, I would then be a, in a multivariate framework where I just gotta have, you know, powers of x. And I'm gonna have x square, x cubed, and whatever. Uh, and is this is that gonna help me predict returns better? I don't think so. Uh, but I think that's the way I would, if the referee was, you know, giving me that comment, I think that's the way I would respond to it and say, okay, fine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nest a general nonlinear function over here by including powers. And uh, my prior is that it's, 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 it's not going to do anything. Uh, all of the, most of the action in predictability is going to come from the first, uh, the first term, the linear term. All right. So then the other comments in the chat were just really two suggestions that you look at. You might want to look at implied correlation as a predictor, and you might want to look at Ian Martin's SVIX as a predictor, and then actually, Mike Chernoff referred you to another paper, but Dima will send you the chat log afterwards so okay. you'll be able to see the reference there. Yeah, I don't see the chat over here for some reason, but I, I look but, forward but to reading Dima it. will send it to you later anyway. Sounds great. Thank you. Anyway, if there are any other questions, anyone who wants to ask another question or make another comment, please, please feel free to use your microphone. Actually, there's just another question popped up in the chat. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so uh, Dobry here. Um, I just wanted to, uh, Dobry, Dobryslav Dobry, I just wanted to ask a bit of a provocative question. Uh, would the economics of the Fed put paper by Anna Cheslak and Annette Wissing Jorgensen also account for some of the predictability patterns? I have to, uh, you have to refresh my memory. So, what, what, what would predict returns in their paper? 
Well, the, the, the argument there is that uh, negative returns, uh, large negative uh, stock market returns uh, spur accommodation by the Fed. And, and oh, yeah, that, yeah, okay, yeah. So it's very much like the picture you showed. I'd have to go look at their model. I, like, you know, I, I, I'd be surprised. Uh, at least I see a clear mechanism there. Basically, if the, if if it's true, if their argument is true, I mean, it's it has recently been refreshed. So I I you know we need to all probably look at it. But I remember when they presented the Fed early on. I uh, mean that is sort of the, their argument is that empirical evidence suggests that large negative stock market returns are strongly co positively correlated with accommodation actions by the Fed. Uh -huh. which then obviously leads to recovery and stimulus and like uh, in, in positive stock market returns. So well, it, I, I, don't think it, I, I just think that this may, it's not, it just could add extra color. I think I really, it's a beautiful argument. Uh, I really like that the chart is just one picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm totally sold on that. And in a way I've been given even comments early on in the VRP regressions by uh, how uh, Joe and others, like uh, in the Chronomagic Conference, I was always saying, hey, well, we've after neg large negative returns, you have that kind of usual <laughs> recovery, and, and you make a very strong case for it. And, and now I think there could be a natural connection also to that paper because it's just part of the, it just solidifies the, why that mechanism is in place, perhaps. Let's think about, like, without, because I don't know the equilibrium uh, mechanism in their paper, or if indeed they even have an equilibrium model in there, but like, let me, like the, the the idea that Fed is out there and dampening dampening a potential stock market uh, fall, it's sort of an exogenous thing to the market in the sense that it in my framework right it's only going to affect the state. So you can introduce a state, you know, or you can alter the 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 innovations in the X variable to have less variance because the Fed is there and you know they you know or that you can alter the distribution of shocks in some way, which will alter the equilibrium and this coefficient, you know, like there's all sorts of way that you can think about a Fed action inside of an equilibrium model that, you know, will generate the same structure in the equilibrium. Uh, so it's not as if they, the, the, persist, the existence of the, the Fed put uh, is going to change the, you know, the equilibrium structure. Uh, no, but that was not the way. I was just thinking that uh, exact more like of the first thing that you said that uh, as an empirical motivation, you can use the, the, the empirical facts in their paper. I think it's more like empirical paper. I'm not, I'm not sure they have a model for that, but I, I, I have to check also the newest version. But, mm -hmm. but I thought that uh, if empirically like they document kind of this uh, pattern in which uh, large negative stock market returns are followed by accommodation, which then generates positive returns and hence, uh, you know, like th this could essentially, you, you are internalizing this in your model without explicitly modeling the Fed basically. You can say, hey, this is what we have empirical evidence suggesting that's happening and here is a model which endogenously generates that. So I, I thought the two are not mutually exclusive. I, I am just trying to say that you, you have also some strong new empirical work that you can use for motivation perhaps. Oh. Well, th thank you, uh, Dabri, I appreciate it. Good comment. Um, can I can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, so thanks for a uh, for a really interesting talk. I thought it was super fascinating. Um, the, my question about the predictability puzzle is, you know, and what you may have said this and I missed it, but how much of it do you think is coming from just power to reject and all from this fairly short sample over which we have options data? And um, and my suggestion is kind of natural. So Alain Morera and I have thought a lot about how to extend the VIX series backwards. Yeah. And we have this measure called the news implied volatility or NVIX. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that cool. so we, in our paper, we actually looked at this predictability of returns and we showed that if you look at this longer sample, there is some predictability. I'm not sure that it lines up the way that your theory says that it should. Well, um, that would be super fascinating if you would send me the time series there. I'd run the test for you. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, it's posted but, on my website, but I'm happy to make it easier for you too. Oh, no, no, no. If it's on your website, I would happily go there and take it right away and see what happens. So running these tests for me is very quick, right? Yeah. Um, all I need is the, the, the state variable and the return and the hit go and it's done in a few minutes. Um, the, um, um, 
So there, there's, you know, the, the question, the question of a longer time series, what I have done is I've done it for variants going back to, um, to the thirties or twenties or whatever, you know, daily, just various, various, actually I use various kind of estimates of spot variance, realized variance, uh, gauge variance and uh, stochastic, well, I, I don't know if I did stochastic volatility, but you know, all sorts of different ways of thinking about it. And uh, of course, it's actually, it's remarkable how flat that relationship actually is. It's a hard zero if you take the realized volatility data going back to, to 1927 and regress returns onto it. It's like a hard zero, the coefficient at all horizons. Um, so um, it's really remarkable actually. But if you have VRP going back, I mean, people, yeah, I, you're, you, you, you may be the one that I'm thinking about that have done that, but I, yeah, I, I, so I'd be super interested to see how it works out for the longer extended uh, sample. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anyone else? All right, then. Uh, thanks very much. I hope to see, I, and thanks to Bjorn for a great talk that inspired a lot of discussion and a lot of questions. And then I hope to see you all again, see everyone again next week. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Yeah, next week we will have Tobias just to tell us about how you shaped uh, price and kernel effects, uh, expected option returns. Thanks, Dimitri. That was uh, that was great. Yeah, I'll send. Well, let me stop. Do you that. have the chat for some reason? I can't see it over here.